1841. Petition of Charles Bruce and others asking to remain in the Commonwealth. December 14th, rejected. That's cold. Did you find any documents concerning what happened to them next? I can pick up the personal property tax list, which Ooh. were taken annually. And, um, oh, there it is, 1841, mm -hmm. 1842, 1843. Mm -hmm. They were paying taxes every year. They didn't leave. They stayed and, um, and stayed for many years. But, Jane, how could they, somebody not notice this black family with 10 kids living illegally in the, in the state of Virginia? Everybody knew they were there, but you look, you look at the list of people that signed their petition, and it's prominent people around Moorfield. Hmm. Um, so these are all white landholders? Mm -hmm. Huh. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So it was a conspiracy of silence? Yes. To protect them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I thought of this period as a period of black and white extremes, or opposites. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this case creates a whole lot of gray when white people are protecting the identity of black freed Negroes who own property. Free black people lived between two worlds. They had more rights than slaves, but they had less rights than their white fellow citizens. They were always vulnerable to racism, but sometimes white people helped them. For over 25 years, Peter Gomes' great-great-grandfather Isaac Bailey lived and worked on a farm in Southampton, Virginia. It was owned by the descendants of a white man named Samuel Bailey. The lives of the white Baileys and the black Baileys were deeply intertwined, extending back another generation to Isaac's parents, Ben and Rose Bailey, Peter Gomes's third great grandparents. This is a deed of emancipation that Samuel Bailey signed in the year 1782. I, Samuel Bailey of Surrey County in Virginia, being fully persuaded that freedom is the natural right of all mankind and that it is my duty to do unto others, I would desire, as I would desire to be done in the like situation. And having under my care 17 Negroes, whom I have heretofore held as slaves of the following names and ages, rose about 11, all and every one of which I also hereby emancipate and set free. Rose about age 11. 11. What year is this? 1782. The revolution is not over. 1782. My word. Well, he was certainly ahead of George Washington, I'll say that. Yeah, and Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and Thomas Jefferson, that's right. The White Baileys were members of the Religious Society of Friends, also known as the Quakers, a group that grappled with the moral contradictions between owning slaves and fighting a war for freedom against the King of England. Fundamental to the effort to rally people against the British is this idea that the British are trying to subject American colonists to slavery. Right? So in all of the rhetoric around the revolution, they're constantly talking about resisting slavery. And the Society of Friends has had an anti-slavery history. And many of them free their slaves in this kind of outpouring of ideas about liberty and equality. Can you imagine how our nation's history would have been different if these early abolitionists in the 18th century had succeeded in ending slavery um, at the end of the Revolutionary War? What a world we would have lived in. What an inheritance we would have had. We would have two centuries of trouble because they, they could not square uh, the conscience with their desire to maintain the benefits of the status quo, the benefits of slavery. Yes. Had they cleaned the house at the beginning, who knows what would have happened? Who knows how great this nation no, really, no, really would be? No. How much trouble we would have been spared. Oh, my God. And in the past and the future. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of our ancestors remained enslaved for more than 80 years following the revolution and reclaiming even the most basic details about their lives is very, very difficult. We now move to your maternal great-great-grandfather and his name was Alex McClam. And he was born in South Carolina 
in about 1847. The only way to learn about a slave ancestor is to identify the owner and look for his records. Am I, am I getting ready to find out my grandfather was owned by Pat Sajak's family? So. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we scoured all the records of South Carolina. So this is what we found. OK, this is a page from the 1860 federal census, the 1860 slave schedule. Slave schedule? Yeah, well, what happened was like this. One o'clock. Whooping. <laughs> one, one twenty-one. Whooping again. <laughs> Two o'clock. Cry. Black people were property, so they they weren't listed in the census because you didn't exist. Wow. You didn't exist. The only way you existed was the same way a cow or a chicken existed, under a white man's name in a separate part of the census, a completely different census called the slave schedule, and then. They didn't list you by name. They listed you by your color, whether you're mulatto, black, your gender, whether you're male or female, and your age. This is the 1860 slave schedule for Solomon McClam. If Solomon owned your great-great-grandfather, Alex, he would be listed as a male slave at about the age of 22. 22, I see a male. That is your great-great-grandfather, no name, 22. Yeah, it was the most brilliantly sinister part of slavery. And I think that that has done a lot to undermine our self-confidence as a people. How does it feel to see a human being reduced to a hash mark? Right. But that was it. They wouldn't let you have any other identity. You're just lost. And you kind of don't belong to anything. And when you don't belong to anything, you're so much more likely to end up in something bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing any of us have accomplished anything <laughs> without without knowing where we're from. Yeah, really. The desire to fill this void has inspired a whole generation of dedicated amateur genealogists like Kathleen Henderson. It's the question that I would love to know is for our first ancestor that came... Uh... We selected Kathleen from a pool of thousands of African Americans who responded to our offer to help one person find their family tree. That at some point in our family's history that slave, slavery was a real, was a real deal. Despite years of research, Kathleen has learned almost nothing about her ancestors before the Civil War. To piece together this information, we have to find the rarest of treasures, an enslaved ancestor listed by first name. Once you identify a likely slave owner, what you're mostly looking at is their property records. So you're interested in things like anything estate-related, wills, probate records, uh, estate inventories, um, deeds, anything that shows a transfer of ownership of any kind of property. We suspected that Kathleen's third great-grandparents, George and Caroline, were owned by a man from Kentucky named Abraham Van Meter. I went looking in the property records of Abraham Van Meter, and this is going to sound a little twisted, but when you're looking for these kind of records, one of the things you always hope for is to find an owner who died in the early 1860s. The reason being is their estate records will list their slaves. This is the 1863 estate inventory for Abraham Van Meter, made just before he died. George, 56 years of age. $300. <laughs> Caroline, 38 years of age, $400. Kathleen, there they are, your great-great-grandparents. Wow. This is, um, I just wish my father was alive still. Mm. Good that somebody kept records. <laughs> well, good thing about a capitalist system. <laughs> <laughs> is that people kept records. The bad thing is they kept records kept of all records. their property, and we happen to be property. <laughs>